Hi book lovers, welcome back to my channel. I am doing my February wrap up today so I'll be talking about all the books, all the romances that I read last month. I did read some non-romances last month as well which is quite a change but it was for a read-along. So I read a total of 23 books. I think there was one or two novellas in that. It was quite a good reading month. It was a good solid reading month but before I get into talking about all the books that I read I do want to share the sponsor for today's video. Today's video is sponsored by Lucy Score. Check out her Knock em Out series, which are these two books. Book one is last year's very popular Things We Never Got Over, and the brand new sequel, book two, which is also a number one New York Times bestseller, Things We Hide From The Light. If you love funny small town romances, you have to give the series a try. I fell in love with Lucy Score last year when I read Things We Never Got Over. This book is hilarious, heartwarming, and so full of banter, and it has the grumpiest grumpy hero that you'll fall in love with. You'll love this adorable small town of Knock'em Out even more when you read the sequel, Things We Hide From The Light. The hero adopts the cutest dog ever and the dog helps him heal from his trauma, all while he falls for his new neighbor. You can find both of these online, in bookstores, or anywhere books are sold. Both are available to read on KU, on Kindle Unlimited, on Amazon, so I'll leave a link down below for you to check them out. A huge thank you to Lucy Score for being today's sponsor. Alright, back to my wrap up. The first book that I read in February, it was actually a debut book, a debut romance. This is Love Shove in New York by N.M. Patel. It was very adorable. I'm giving this one three to three and a half stars. We have an interracial romance where the heroine, she comes from India and she goes to the U.S. to attend college. She wants to pursue a career in architecture. In one of her classes, this is where she meets the hero, Sam, who is very much not an Indian boy that her parents would approve of, but they do connect. They slowly fall for each other, all while discovering each other's backgrounds, their cultures. Akira's parents are always in the back of her mind. She is feeling very torn between staying loyal to her parents who want her to be with a fellow Indian guy and being with Sam who is slowly becoming so important to her. This debut has a ton of great diversity, a ton of different cultures. We have a lot of Akira's background here with her South Asian heritage or culture. And I did really like reading about a character of color who wasn't actually from the U.S. So you get to see the U.S. in a different perspective. The only thing was that the romance here, it was okay. I didn't really fall in love with it. I enjoyed Akira's character who is very fresh, very bubbly, very sunshiny. I liked her character a lot more than Sam's who is very reserved. But when they do finally get together, they are very, very sweet. And you can definitely feel how hard Sam falls for Akira. Like this is the kind of hero who would be willing to do anything for the woman that he loves. So it's not at all a bad debut. I enjoyed myself when I was reading it and I do recommend it if you want some diversity in your romances. I did read two Kristen Becker Ritchie books last month mostly because I did an interview with them which is up on my channel. I wanted to get caught up on all their books before chatting with them. And now I am finally all cut up. So the first of the two books that I read was Infamous Like Us, which is book 10 in the Like Us series. I love Kristen Becca, but I am so glad I am finally done with this trilogy, this Kitsuleti trilogy, because I I'm kind of over it. I never thought I wouldn't enjoy a Kristen Becca Ritchie book, but this book and this Thruple is easily the worst one out of all the pairings and all the books. There was just something about this final book in their trilogy that annoyed the crap out of me, so I'm giving this one two stars. I just couldn't stand Sully, Banks, and Akara here. Sully especially, I just couldn't understand. Like the main plot, the main antagonist of their trilogy are online trolls and bullies and how they love to hate on Sully. And Sully herself, she is so hung up on how people perceive her online. She just can't stop obsessing over the mean comments. If I had a loving family, a loving extended family, if I had millions of dollars at my disposal, two loving boyfriends, and I was an Olympic medalist, I could not care less about what cyber bullies were saying online because they literally don't matter. But that was the main plot of this book and I got so frustrated and so annoyed about constantly reading about this, about the paparazzi, about the online stuff. It all just ruined the book for me and I really 
did not enjoy reading this one. Thankfully, the next Kristen Becker Ritchie book that I read was so much better. I read Misfits Like Us, which is the first book in Luna and Donnelly's trilogy. This book reminded me a lot of the earlier Addicted series books in terms of vibes. Luna is this quirky nerd who likes to write fan fiction in her spare time. Donnelly is her brother's new bodyguard. He actually used to be a bodyguard for the Cobalt Kids, and he's also the bodyguard that Luna is the closest one to. They really share this beautiful connection with each other, but the thing that's standing in the way of them getting together is Luna's dad, Lo. We get to see quite a bit of Lauren Hale in this book, so if you've missed him, uh, you will be happy about this book. Unfortunately, Lo hates Donnelly, or more like he hates the idea of Donnelly with Luna, but Luna and Donnelly just have so many feelings for each other. They are so freaking adorable, so they try to sneak in any time that they can to be around each other. They are the cutest couple ever, and they might be my favorite couple of the Leica series, maybe. I also loved the epistolary romance aspect of this book as well. Luna and Donnelly chat online anonymously with each other, but they have no idea that the other person is the one that they're crushing on. They bond over their favorite shows, over their nerdiness, and it is so adorable. So this one is great, it was super sweet, I'm giving it four stars, and I I already cannot wait for the rest of their trilogy. I then read two Adelaide Forest books last month. I read two more of her dark mafia romances. First, I continued with my series read of the Beauty and Lies series. So Until Retribution Burns is a book three, and this book is kind of the book where we finally get to see the heroine Issa grow into herself. We get to see Issa owning up to her new mafia queen role. In the first two books, she is terrified. I mean, she's very young and she's thrown into this dark mafia underworld against her will by a man who is so obsessed with her and will literally never let her go. But in this third book, she finally realizes that she does have some agency. She does have what it takes to rule beside Raphael. So this is another solid read in the series. I'm giving it four stars. It's been such a fun series. It is insanely over the top, but still so good. If you love dark romances, if you love a good anti-hero, I highly recommend the series. I also decided to try Adelaide Forrest's other mafia romance series. Bloody Hands is book one in the Belandi crime syndicate series. Each book is about a different couple, so they can be read as standalones. And this first couple has the second chance romance trope. I really wanted to love this one because of how much I enjoyed the Beauty and Lies series, but this book ended up being just okay. I gave it three stars. It was kind of boring actually. There was just nothing exciting or unique about it. It also felt like it was trying a little bit too hard with the dark mafia romance aspect. Like the Beauty and Lie series, it worked because it was so over the top that it was entertaining, but here it just felt very flat. So the main characters are Ivory and Matteo. They were high school sweethearts, but then he ended up breaking her heart for some mysterious reason and treating her terribly after their breakup. Twelve years later now, Ivory gets caught up in some sort of bank robbery that has ties to the mafia, which is how she re-enters Mateo's life. So Ivory meets with Mateo to figure out what's going on and to finally find out the truth about their breakup, and this is pretty much the chance for Mateo to force her to give him a second chance. Never mind the fact that he didn't even bother to look for her in the past 10 years, didn't bother to ask for a second chance when he's known where she was this whole time. He never tried to win her back until now, which was a little sus. And Ivory, I guess she kind of tried to tell him no to fight against him, but he would just use sex to get her to comply, which was a little annoying to read. And then there's also some mafia stuff that I really wasn't invested in, so I didn't really remember that much of it. Overall, it's definitely not as good as the Beauty and Lie series, at least this first book isn't. My next read was Always You by Samantha Young. So this book I actually had no idea that the dad from the first book in the Adair Family series was getting his own book. So this is book three, The dad's book and it's an age gap romance. You have an older hero, younger heroine. He is 13 years older and he is her brother's 
best friend slash ex bodyguard. So it's also a bodyguard romance. It's probably the angstiest of the series so far just because there's so much pining and so much longing. It's a kind of romance where both the main characters already love each other but the hero pushes the heroine away because he doesn't think that he's worthy of her or good enough for her. So there's a lot of tortured history between them and this sort of setup in general I'm not usually a huge fan of. It can be hit or miss for me because it can get pretty annoying to read about a hero who is the only reason why the romance isn't happening and also his reasoning for pushing the heroine away is usually dumb too. But I feel like Samantha Young walked the fine line of angst and annoyance very well here. I mean yes I did still get frustrated with Mac with the hero and there was a lot of back and forth between him and Aro but I still grew really invested in the romance and I was rooting for their happily ever after. And like the rest of the series we do have some romantic suspense. It's a small Scottish town romantic suspense series so we do have the heroine getting into danger and the hero wanting to protect her from it. And the nice thing about this book was that we have a hero who actually decides to go to therapy to try to figure out what's going on in his head, why he try to push the heroine away so many times and hurt her constantly. I feel like we don't have enough heroes in therapy and a lot of them could use um, a lot of it. But this one was good. I really liked it. I gave it four stars. It's another solid book in this series and I definitely need to continue with the rest. I then read Timeless by Daphne Perry which is the final book in the Lark Cove series although technically it's more like a novella. It was pretty cute. Nothing amazing but still easy to read. It was nice to be back in the Lark Cove world, even though the series personally it's not my favorite from Devney Perry. The heroine is a workaholic CEO. Aubrey has no time for relationships, no time for love until she meets the police officer hero Landon. He falls head over heels for her so fast and he pretty much wants her to give him, to give them a chance. It's a very quick read. If you love the series I would say read it, otherwise it's not entirely necessary. I mean I gave it three and a half stars. It's cute but nothing amazing. I then read Bulldozer by Pete Angelico. This is a sports romance with a single mom and a grumpy hero. Amanda is the single mom of a 10 year old boy and she is living her best life. Her life is all planned out and her next step is to move in to her brother's beach house but unfortunately when she moves in there's already someone living there. And that person is Grant, our hero. He is a former NFL player. He's also Amanda's brother's former teammate, which is why the brother kind of got things mixed up and both Amanda and Grant are now living in this beach house. Grant had a back injury that forced him to retire from football early and he's never really gotten over this loss which is why he is such a huge grump, a huge jerk to everyone including Amanda. Their first meeting is actually kind of hilarious. I love the banter between them. I love the whole enemies to lovers thing although it's more like enemies to friends to lovers here. Both of them try to make the other person leave the beach house but then they reluctantly agree to be roommates. The romance is so sweet. A little bit slow burn and I love the relationship that forms between Grant and Amanda's son. I had so much fun reading this. The only reason why I'm kind of torn between three and a half to four stars is because I wasn't a huge fan of the third act breakup here. Like I love third act breakups, don't get me wrong. I think they're great for some angst and for potential of some groveling but I didn't really understand the reason for it here. The heroine came across as pretty selfish. It was like her way or the highway. It just didn't seem right with me so that's why I'm kind of torn between my readings. But besides that I really did have fun with this book and I did enjoy myself. I also finally read the new Tessa Bailey. This is Secretly Yours. It was very adorable, very classic Tessa Bailey so it follows her familiar formula of insta-love, insta-lust, a very obsessed hero. He gets all alpha and possessive over the heroine and there's a lot of steam. This new series, it's the A Vine Mess series, it's set on a vineyard, the hero's family's vineyard. It's a grumpy sunshine romance, we do have some forced proximity with the heroine who is a gardener. She is hired to work on the hero's 
Estates Gardens and they actually knew each other back when they were younger when they were in school. Hallie had the biggest crush on Julian but he had no idea that she even existed until they almost kissed one night but nothing really happened after that nothing came out of it and fast forward like a decade later Julian is back in their small town and Hallie finds herself still with a crush on him. The sad thing is that Julian doesn't remember Hallie at all. He doesn't recognize her and he is unhappily lusting over her anytime she goes to his house to work on the gardens. He finds himself getting very distracted every time he sees Hallie. This hero is a very closed off type of character. He doesn't let anyone close. He's not close with his family. He is pretty cold to everyone and he tries to be cold with the heroine and he hates being around people whereas Hallie is his total opposite so she's very much the sunshine to his grump. But slowly you can see him melting every time that she's around him and she brings her two gigantic dogs with her too. They were really fun and adorable together. I mean Hallie is just very easy to love, a very lovable character. Julian, you you slowly warm up to him. But you pretty much get what you expect from a Tessa Bailey book in this one. You get insta love, an over-the-top hero, and some dirty talk. It's not like a new favorite for me. I still enjoyed it though. I gave it four stars and I am dying for the next book in the series which is about Julian's sister and it has a marriage of convenience. My next read was Make-A-Wish by Helena Hunting. This one I also gave four stars to. This is the third and final book in the Spark House series. If you love single dad romances you'll like this one. So Harley is the last of her sisters to get her romance and her hero is an older single dad who she used to nanny for. Harley help take care of Gavin's infant newborn daughter after his wife died in childbirth. Harley fell very hard for this man and they almost kissed one time but then Gavin stopped it. Seven years later in present day Gavin is now back in their town with his daughter and these two reunite at this birthday party that Spark House hosted. It gets a little messy just because Harley currently has a boyfriend, one that obviously is not right for her but she's still with him. But she also still feels that connection with Gavin and his daughter. Like anytime Gavin would ask to hang around or help with his daughter, Harley would come running. You do kind of feel bad for the boyfriend but not really. Just because anytime Gavin and Harley are actually together they are just so perfect. So it's a sweet romance but I would not call it a rom-com. Like the whole series it looks like rom-coms but it's not really. This one especially we have a lot going on outside of the romance. Like Harley is struggling with her role at her family's company. She's feeling like the odd one out and Gavin is dealing with some very messy in-laws who are making things very difficult for him and his daughter. I thought it was a great read though. I did really like how things ended for all the three sisters, all the three couples, and the epilogue was so adorable. I love good epilogues. And then my next read was The Duke Gets Even by Joanna Shoup. I have been slacking with my historical romance reads lately unfortunately. This was my one historical romance read of February. It's the fourth standalone in the Fifth Avenue Rebel series and it's got the fairly classic historical romance trope where we have a poor hero, a poor duke hero who needs to marry someone wealthy and a rich heroine, an heiress heroine who doesn't want anything to do with marriage. The opening scene here was fantastic with Nellie and Lockwood meeting in the middle of the night at the, I think it's the ocean. So they're in the water, they're both naked and things get intimate pretty quickly. The steam is so good, like the chemistry is hot. But then soon enough Nellie finds out that Lockwood is actually courting her friend because he needs to marry someone with money. But the connection is too good between them so they do end up starting this hot little affair. I mean anytime you need some good steam in your historical romances you need to read Joanna Shoup. I love how she always delivers when it comes to the smut in her historicals. But going back to the story, by this point Lockwood is like, F it, I don't care, I just want you Nellie. And Ellie, unfortunately, is like, no, I I can't marry you. She is a very independent heroine. She's been fighting for women's rights throughout the whole book. And I will admit this part did get a little frustrating just
just because of how much she continues to push Lockwood away. Even though she knows she wants him, she knows that he is the one for him. So I did feel bad for this guy, but whatever. Overall, it was very hot, a little bit angsty, and it was really fun. So I gave it four stars. I then read a few Candy Steiner books next just because I did a, an Instagram live with her. So I finally got to reading two of her Red Zone Rivals books and they were very fun. I could definitely see why a lot of people love them. So Blindside was the one that I read first. This is the second book in the series, the the one that blew up. I read the series completely out of order. I read two and then four, but each book can be read fine as a standalone, so we're good. Blindside has the fake dating trope. Clay is our very popular hot football player on campus and he recently got dumped by his high school sweetheart who he thought he was gonna marry. So he concocts this whole plan to get her back. He asks his team's PR rep Gianna to fake date him in order to make his ex jealous and Gianna only agrees because she does want to finally make her crush, this musician guy, finally notice her. If you like the classic shy girl slash popular jock type of dynamic, then this book is for you. It is very new at all. I know I would have eaten this book up if I was still back in college. I was a little nervous going into this one because I'm usually not a huge fan of reading about heroes who are so hung up on their exes. But here is pretty fine to read just because Clay got over his ex pretty quickly. He became all about Gianna, whereas she was still trying to make things work with her crush. So we do have a hero who falls first here, which I always appreciate. It was just a very sweet read, nothing all that angsty. Like Candy Center is more known for, but it really worked well here, so I give it four stars. The other Red Zone Rivals book I read was the latest one, book four, Hail Mary. This one I'm also giving four stars, but it does edge out blindside just a little bit more just because Leo is so perfect. So this is Leo and Mary's romance and we have the roommates trope here. I also love the unique setup of this one because Mary and Leo, they went to high school together, but he never noticed her because she was the one that everyone bullied and he was the popular jock. But then they find each other anonymously online through gaming, like they start gaming together and they become best friends through that. Mary does figure out that it's been Leo she's been talking to, but he has no idea. So when she finally gets the courage to tell him at school in front of everyone that she's the one he's been talking to, he unfortunately rejects her. So now in present day when he's in college and she's training to be a tattoo artist, they become neighbors but she hates him. And what sucks even more is when her house becomes unlivable because of some sort of accident going on, she's forced to room with Leo and his other roommates. I love the bromance here between Leo and his roommates, his friends, and I loved how his friends also became close with Mary and how they become so protective over her. And because there's some good force proximity, the chemistry is just through the roof here. Leo is very determined to make Mary his, but he has no idea why she hates him so much. But I love these two characters. I loved how well developed they were, how well rounded their characters were written. So this was another winner for me. I do have to finish up the rest of the series to see if Hail Mary is still my favorite though. I then read Radiant Sin by Katie Robber, which I gave three stars to. This is book four in the Dark Olympus series and we have Apollo and Cassandra's romance here. I'm not familiar with the mythology of Apollo and Cassandra, so I just went into this one. I read it for <laughs> the book that I was. So we have some fake dating here and it's also a boss employee romance. Though I will admit there's not much to the fake dating aspect here so don't get too excited about that. The book feels more like a turning point for the series like for the overarching plot which sadly did bring the romance down a bit for me. We get some heavy politics within the 13 which I'm just not invested in and I don't care about. I wanted more of Cassandra and Apollo here who are just so much nicer and sweeter than all the other couples in the series. Apollo is actually a good guy in the 13, which is apparently unheard of. So lots of things happen in this one, including a whole murder mystery. If you like the series so far, I would say read this one just because you pretty much know what to expect. I also got to reading some more Lucy's score books this month, two of her pink books. I've been wanting to read more of her ever since reading Things We Never Got Over, which was one of my favorites from last year. So I first read By a Thread, which is a standalone. It's got a very grumpy hero and we have an office romance here. I gave this one four stars. It's a solid romance, very funny, and the characters are so entertaining to read. So with the office romance here, the heroine is the hero's new employee. The way Dominic and Allie actually 
actually end up working together is kind of hilarious and very unique. Ali used to work as a waitress at this one restaurant and when Dominic comes in he refuses to end his phone call which is apparently a rule for the restaurant. So they trade a bunch of insults right off the bat. Ali ends up spelling out F you to Dominic on his pizza and he gets her boss to fire her. Dominic's mom is his dinner date and she witnessed this whole thing. So when they leave the restaurant, she actually offers Ali a new job at her fashion magazine empire. Dominic is not happy about this because he wants her as much as he hates her. And there's a very strict no fraternization policy because his dad was awful, a total creep, who would take advantage of his employees when he worked at that fashion magazine. I had so much fun reading this book. It's a great enemies to lovers romance. If you love banter, you will love this book. Dominic and Ali constantly go head to head. The chemistry is wild. Dominic does not stop popping out boners. So it was a great read, another fat book from Lucy Score, but the pages are totally worth it. I also read one of my most anticipated reads of 2023, which is Things We Hide From The Light. This is the sequel to Things We never got over, which I loved last year. I'd been so excited to read more of this small town of the Knock'em Out series ever since the first book was such a big hit. I know most people wanted Lucia next, but Nash is book two and he is such a sweetheart. The sequel has a very different feel to the first book just because Nash is dealing with depression and PTSD from the trauma that happened at the end of book one. I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but the sequel is mostly just Nash dealing with the aftermath of what happened all while falling for his new neighbor. Lena is in town doing her own little investigation in Knock em Out, and she moves in right next door to Nash. Lena is tough and badass, but she does have a bit of trouble letting people in. She's very anti-relationship, whereas Nash is all in. He wants everything with Lena. One of my favorite things about this book is how Nash adopts the most adorable dog named Piper and oh my gosh I loved this dog so much. I just love reading about dogs who have such big personalities in books even though she's such a tiny little thing she's she's her own character. And I loved how this small town especially Sloane and Naomi just welcomed Lena into their arms. She gets adopted into the small town and it was so sweet to read. The suspense part here was actually written a little bit better than it was in book one because we get a gradual progression of the plot and it's not all just thrown in at the end. We do get a ton of all the side characters which made me so happy and there is some great setup for the third and final book which is Lucian and Sloane's romance. So this was a great sequel. I really enjoyed it. I give it four stars. Book one is still my favorite so far, but I did adore Nash and Lena. For my next book, I read a novella from Saffron A. Kent. I've been slowly continuing with her St. Mary's Rebel series, so this one is book 1.5. It's called The Wild Mustang and the Dancing Fairy. It's the prequel to A Gorgeous Villain, which is book two, so we get the setup of Callie and Reed's romance here. He's a soccer player who Callie's brothers all hate. She has four brothers and I love all of them. They pretty much raised her after their parents left her, and one of the brothers, who is Reed's age, they're actually huge enemies. So Callie having a crush on Reed is like the biggest betrayal. He's a total man whore though and Callie never expects him to ever notice her until he does. And this is the beginning of the relationship though things of course don't end well at the end of this prequel. I'm giving this maybe three, three and a half stars. The 0.5 is just for Callie's brothers though because I love them so much. One of them does have a book in the series. I think he's book three and I cannot wait to get to that one. So after reading this prequel I did have to read the full length book for reading Callie which is A Gorgeous Villain. This is book two in the St. Mary's Rebel series. I'm also very much in love with my special edition hardcover of it. It is so pretty. This one I'm giving three and a half to four stars. I'm still not entirely sure how I want to rate it, but um, this book, the hero calls the heroine's vagina a fairy pussy. Let's just get this out of the way and mention the cringe that is the dirty talk in this book. Honestly, all the dirty talk in the series so far has been very, very cringy. I guess it's just a Saffron A. Kent thing. Her writing is interesting, not in the best way. It's very, it tries very hard to be poetic and that's not my favorite thing. So the writing here isn't for me, but thankfully I did listen to the audiobooks for the series, so I was able to forgive it. A little bit better. I know if I tried to read the ebook or the physical copy I would have struggled a bit more. So this is just an FYI on her writing style. Like if Fairy Pussy gives you any sort of indication on her writing style, 
there you go. But let's get back to the story itself. We do have a surprise pregnancy romance here. And yes, the heroine is like 18. She's in high school, though technically it's a reform school for girls. So at the end of the prequel, Reed betrayed Callie and left her for two years. Now she's back and she slips back onto his dick because it is too hard to resist and she gets pregnant. The pregnancy is the main plot and it actually wasn't too bad. Like when she gets pregnant, I enjoyed the book a lot more. Reed steps up instantly and immediately, which made me like him better. He then spends the rest of the book trying to get back into Callie's good graces. So it's kind of a groveling romance. I wouldn't say the groveling is amazing or anything, but the hero changes his ways and he does treat the heroine right. I did love getting more of the friendship group, the girl group within the series. All the heroines become best friends at this reform school and I loved how supportive they all were for each other. So the romance takes his time to warm up to, but I was happy with the way things played out. My next read was Throttled by Lauren Asher. I finally got to reading something of hers that was not the Dreamland Billionaire series. A lot of people have been telling me to try this series, her Dirty Air series, which is an F1 romance series, Formula One, racing, car racing. And this first book was okay. I give it three stars. It wasn't too bad, but I didn't love it. The Formula One aspect was fantastic. I love that. I love reading something different in my romances, and I don't see F1 romances all that often, but the actual romance itself was pretty boring. It was very forgettable. The hero Noah is your cliched, typical man whore hero. He doesn't give a crap about women, and he is kind of awful to the heroine at the beginning. The heroine Maya is his new teammate sister and she also works as a vlogger. So she does join her brother and all his teammates onto their whole world tour. There's lots of forced proximity here but I just was not feeling the chemistry. The romance just wasn't interesting to me and I was just there for the racing. So this one simple three stars. I then read some non-romances for the first time in a very long time. I read The Six of Crows duet by Lee Bardugo for a read-along. I've never read The Six of Crows series, though I have read the Grisha trilogy, but it's been years so I don't remember anything except for what I watched in the Shadow and Bone series on Netflix. So I read book one, Six of Crows, and it was a bit of a struggle to get through. I'm giving this one three stars. It took a while to get back into this whole world with the whole world building and getting used to all these different characters. I'm just not the biggest fan of multiple character point of views in my books and this one we have like six if not more. It was just hard for me to get invested in the story at first just because there's so much going on. There's so many characters doing their own thing. I did eventually get used to everything and I did think all the characters were interesting. I liked learning about their backgrounds. I just didn't need all the different point of views. If you've never read the series I feel like I'm the last one to read these books. The main plot is Kaz, who is the leader of this gang of thieves. He wants revenge against the man who led to his brother's death and he gets his gang of six to go after him. Cricket Kingdom book two was a little bit better for me. I'm giving this one four stars. I was definitely more invested after getting to know all these different characters and I was just pretty much waiting for that satisfying ending for the bad guy to get his comeuppance. Unfortunately, one of the characters that I really liked uh, dies in here. So I was like, well, that's great. But besides that, I did like seeing all the individual romances popping up here because obviously being me, I'm gonna focus on the romances. I am glad though that I finally got to reading this duet. So I am fully prepared to get to the second season of Shadow and Bone. And then for my romance book club, I read The Choice by Ashley Jade. This is the spinoff to The Words, which I loved last year. The Choice is the first book in the Starcross Lovers duet, and it's about one of the other band members from The Words and their PR person. I was so excited to read this one after how much I love The Words, but sadly, I did not love this one. The spinoff was not what I wanted or expected. If I had known that this book was more of a prequel to the words, I could have adjusted my expectations, but I had no idea. This book is mainly set in the past with Memphis and Skylar still in high school, and it was kind of anticlimactic to read. I was expecting the timeline to overlap with the words, but we get none of that here. This is just a messy teenage romance where Skylar meets Memphis's foster brother, Josh, and falls for him, even though Memphis Memphis was the one who saw her first. He definitely fell for her first and you know that these two are meant to be together but 
there's Josh. All three of these characters have been through some awful trauma that I didn't remember in the words. Like Skylar and Josh were both raped as children. The three of them become neighbors when Josh and Memphis get fostered by a couple who are thankfully good people. And throughout the book you can see exactly how awful and mean and manipulative Josh is. We knew from the words that Josh sucked. He was a junkie, he was a terrible influence to Phoenix, to the whole band, but now we finally see how deep it goes. I don't know if I should applaud the author for writing such a good bad guy, but Josh did ruin the book for me. I'm really hoping that the sequel is going to be better for me because we are finally getting that rock star aspect and Josh is going to be gone, so we'll see. And then the final book that I read in February was Bittersweet Memories by Katharina Mara. I loved reading my first book from her back in January, so I was very excited to read more from her. Sadly, my library got her audiobooks completely out of order, so first I did read book one in the Off Limits series, but then I jumped to this book, which is book four, the last book in the series. But it still sounded perfect for me because it's an amnesia romance and it's a boyfriend's brother romance. And also a second chance romance, but because the heroine has amnesia, she doesn't remember that part. So the first part of this book is where we get to see the main characters, Alana and Silas, growing up and falling in love. And then an accident happens that causes Alana to lose all her memories and for Silas to never be able to find her. Part two is years later when out of the blue one day Alana shows up in Silas's life again. She is his newest employee and she's also dating his brother. But we have a hero here who knows exactly what he wants and he knows that Alana belongs with him and not his brother. He gets all alpha here because he's not gonna let anyone stand in his way of being with Alana, not his brother, and not even Alana herself. So this man is determined to say the least and I loved it. It was a great book. I'm giving this one four stars. My one main complaint is not actually the book but the blurb of this book. It sets for some wrong expectations. Like when you read this blurb you expect this book to be about a story of revenge. You think the heroine wants revenge against her bad boyfriend, so she goes after his brother. But the whole revenge thing doesn't actually play out that way. It doesn't happen. So don't go into this book expecting some fun revenge because there isn't any. You can expect the amnesia, but it's just gonna take a while to get there because the whole part one thing it's in the past, and then you finally get to the amnesia. But that's it for my February wrap-up. Those are all 23 books that I read last month. Let me know your thoughts if you read any of the same books. As always, links to everything will be down in the description below. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you all next time. Bye!